I'm Grace Jordan McFadden with Mrs. Majeska Simpkins, a native of Columbia, South Carolina, a leader in the area of civil rights and one of South Carolina's outstanding citizens. Mrs. Simpkins, we might begin by asking you to just give some historical background about Mrs. Simpkins. I was born in Columbia, South Carolina, December 5th, 1899, and my and have always lived here. My parents were born in Columbia. My father was a bricklayer by trade, and uh, when he was married, he believed, as would be hard to believe today in the housing situation that we now have. He believed that when a man married, he should take his wife into a home of his own. And so the house into which he took my mother as a bride still stands, and there it was there that I was born. My father's parents were born in Columbia. My mother's parents, my mother's father was born in Athens, Georgia, born as a slave, and we still have in our family a pair of trousers which he wore as a little boy standing by the the uh, slave auction block as his mother was being sold away from him his mother by the way found him later as he was married and living in Columbia my and he died here she died here in Columbia with her son my mother his mother was born in Sumter in Sumter County South Carolina she was born as a slave and belonged to a family of Sealses, and had a, had some of the back, somewhat of the background of the Turkish colony that still remnants of which still live in Sumter County. At one time, the the uh, descendants of those Turks, how they got there, I don't know, but uh, up in recent years, until very recently, they could not go to either the white or the black schools. I don't know what their education situation is today. My mother was a teacher before I was born and stayed in the educational process in some measure as long as she lived. And my, my mother and father were fearless persons and taught their children that no one was better than they unless they behaved better than they did. And we were taught to respect all people without regard to race or color are, are the, there was no denominational prejudice allowed in our family. What were your parents' names? My father's name was Henry Clarence Monteith. My mother's name was Rachel Hull Monteith. And you mentioned their parents. What were their parents' names? My mother's name was Sarah Hull. Mm -hmm. And her father's name was George Oh, mm -hmm. I have a cousin, by the way, a first cousin, uh, still living, who's, who's is named for his grandfather. My mother's, my father's father was named Walter Monteith. He was an outstanding attorney in Columbia at that time. He was a product of the, uh, I like to call it the moonlight integration. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, my mother, my father's mother, his name was Mary Dobbins Brown, mm -hmm. but my father was given and always uh, wore his uh, father's name. His father visited us when we were little children. I remember him uh, very clearly mm -hmm. and how he was very proud of my brother who is still living and who is president of the bank in this town and for years was one of the outstanding physicians and surgeons in Columbia. Since he's reached a certain age, he does, does very little practice now. But I remember my uh, white grandfather, and I remember my black grandmother, hmm. who definitely was black, one of the prettiest black women I ever saw. And, and uh, that was, my father's name was Walter Monteith, an outstanding attorney in Columbia at that time. My grandmother's name was Mary Dobbins Brown. The Dobbins Keith Memorial Building at, at uh, Morris College is named for one of her sisters who was outstanding in religious work in this state during that era. 
Were you educated in the public schools of South Carolina? Uh, no, I never went to public schools. We always went, always went to private schools. I mean, the older children of us. Mm -hmm. At that time, Benedict College was supposed to give the very best education that could be acquired by Negroes. And I, the first day I went to school, I went to school at Benedict. They had classes from the Prima hmm. on up through college at that hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And the first day I went to school, I went to the, what they call the practice school at Benedict. And the last day I did my undergraduate work, I did it at Benedict. Oh my goodness. And my sister, uh, I have a sister who died in 1926, and my brother, Dr. Monteith, the three of us went from Prima all the way through college at Benedict. What was significant about that education? Well, uh, the, um, as you know, uh, schools like uh, Benedict and Claflin and Spelman and, and uh, those schools were, were uh, founded and nurtured by Northerners called Yankees. They came down, many of them came for nothing. They dedicated their lives to the training of the children of the freedmen. Mm -hmm. And so um, I came up under that type of atmosphere where, where there was a thoroughness. I can say this, I've said it repeatedly, you didn't get today's lesson tomorrow, you got today's lesson today. And uh, it's very much like banking. Banking closes, banking activity closes at a, the, that day, mm -hmm. for that day. And so what they gave us an, assi an assignment, that assignment was to be done that day. Mm -hmm. And it was thorough, the, the basics, with, uh, the teaching of the basics, we, uh, and also we, they had strict biblical training. That is, we had, we had classes in Bible that had to be passed, just like we passed in arithmetic or geography, anything else. And then we had chapel every day, and everybody had to go to chapel, and everybody had to have a Bible. Hmm. And everybody read Bible in chapel, responsive readings, so that um, I have been not only a, a student of the Bible all my life, but a student of world religions, because I am not a person who believes that the uh, Judeo-Christian religion is the only religion that everybody doesn't believe in is going to hell. I don't believe in that. I, so I've been a student of religion all my life, but the background of that interest was those dedicated northern teachers that came south to help educate the freedmen, okay. the children of the freedmen. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Simpkins, your name is synonymous with civil rights in South Carolina. What sparked your initial interest in civil rights? I guess the uh, background of my mother and father's fearlessness, mm -hmm. and my mother, um, the Niagara movement, oh, uh, predated the NAACP. Mm -hmm. I guess you've heard about the Niagara Movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, they printed, as I remember, a magazine called The Voice. Mm -hmm. And my mother subscribed to that. And my mother was a great reader. She'd have her children sit around and listen to important things, particularly about what happened to our people. Mm -hmm. She read to us about every lynching. You know, there's a great era of lynching. And she read to us you would think that a mother wouldn't read to her child about those atrocities, but she did. We always had a newspaper, a daily paper, and at night after we got through with the general run of the work of the day, we'd sit around and she'd read to us and explain what was happening. And so um, uh, I think that we were inspired uh, with the, with the idea that we should dedicate ourselves to the service of the people and that it, that it was, um, that you didn't need honor for doing service, mm -hmm. but you should be, be condemned for not doing it if you were able to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's been my philosophy all the way through life. I never felt that I should be praised and honored for doing what I had been blessed to be able to do. You were one of the founders of the South Carolina. Yes. NAACP. What was the reason for the formation of the NAACP in South Carolina? The um, inequities in education, the fact that we had a white primary that shut us out of the uh, electoral process. You know, all of us know quite well that 
the uh, 13 colonists fought England on the cry of taxation without representation. And there, 150 years about after the revolution, we were still being taxed without representation. And so we decided to go to, co we decided we needed an organization and the, the, um, <coughs> the, um, idea came from one Mr. Bird who had moved in here from North Carolina. And uh, we came together. It happens that Mr. Bird and I are the only two living initiators of that group. That's Mr. Levi Bird. Levi Bird of Chirol. And so um, we decided on Mr. Bird's inspiration that we should have a uh, state organization of the few branches that were organized at that time, which were perhaps about seven. And then we called together the representatives of those branches, and then we decided that we would make our first fight for the vote. Now, uh, you know history, you're teaching history, and these the young people in school know history, and that that during the reign of um, Ben Tillman, the black people were totally disfranchised. Ben Tillman, as you would read in the uh, in, a, in a book by one Mr. Jordan, who is now dead, the the I, the uh, history of Ben Tillman totally disfranchising Negroes in South Carolina. And prior to that, I mean, then they had what they called the grandfather clause. Mm -hmm which meant that if your daddy voted for Wade Hampton, you could vote. Mm -hmm. Well, a whole lot of them's daddies voted for Wade Hampton because they were slave masters and slave masters' mm -hmm. children. But they weren't going to own their granddaddies, you know, publicly so they could get to vote. But anyway, when the grandfather clause went out, then they brought in uh, the, uh, you'd have to uh, be white and 21, and then later they brought in this uh, literacy thing. And we would go and appeal to the, uh, rich and kind of democratic people here, and they'd say they'd take it under advisement. And so finally we got tired of appealing. Mm -hmm. And we decided that we would go to court. And the event, eventually we got the vote under the Wearing decision. The, um, well, in the, it went on up Supreme Court, but, but it started with the Wearing's Court here in Columbia. We were not interested only in the vote, but we realized that early and had realized some years before that the only salvation was going to be at the ballot box. So we were concerned about the vote. We were concerned about the fact that black teachers teaching the same classes, doing the same work, for instance, in the city schools of Columbia, which was supposed to be the most outstanding system in the state. Black teachers, or Negro teachers at that time, that's what, they were, what we called them then, they were um, paid just about half as much as white teachers were paid for doing the same work. And we were able to get little inklings and news about that, you know, and sometimes you'd be standing in line in the bank cashing your checks and you'd see what the other one's got right in front of you, you know, mm -hmm. and so. The, um, the inequities in education, that is in school buildings and in teacher salaries. And then, you know, you talk about the transportation, all this hullabaloo about busing. Why, the white people were the first ones to ride in the buses, and they didn't let us ride in them, you know. Mm -hmm. My mother taught for years, and they'd pass her children on the road, and sometimes a bus driver would find it was a dirt road then in front of her school. He'd find a puddle that he could run into and splash the mud on the colored children and spit out of the windows on them and all like that, passing the black, no, no good black school to go to the best they could find the white school, which none of them would fit because they found in the First World War that the whites trained in the, what they called the best white schools couldn't come up with whites from some other areas. Mm -hmm. So um, the, um, edu the education, the inequities in education and uh, transportation to schools, the, the inequities in provisions for schools, for instance, my mother's school, the, uh, where, where they had five months, first they had, when we moved out there, they had three-month schools. Then they went to four months, and then if they wanted five months, the parents would have to get together and give children struts and box parties and other kind of things like that, and maybe pay the teachers another month. They'd pay the teachers. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. And then they moved up to six months, and after a while, they got to seven months by it. But the county would pay for only a certain amount of that time, then you'd pay the rest. Then for wood, very often children would come to school wet, and uh, they'd have to get wood from out of the woods themselves, and then they'd have to dry the children before they could teach them. Now, that, I've seen that. I'm not talking about something somebody told me. So those things were not only true in, in the rural areas of Columbia, they were true all over South Carolina. The school buildings were poor, and if it hadn't been for large halls and churches, Negro children wouldn't have had anywhere to go to school. What do you feel, then, were the major achievements of the South Carolina NAACP at the time when the organization was really struggling to do something about it? Well, the winning of the, um, of the 1954 decision, the, um, and we won the transportation case. The, the, um, we did something other in that time that wasn't definitely an NAACP activity in that when the, 50, when the people signed the uh, petitions against school segregation, uh, the squeeze, what we call the squeeze, was put on them in various of these rural areas where many of them had had a credit, mm -hmm. extended them for years. Mm -hmm. And well, in Orangeburg, they stopped selling them Coca-Cola and, and uh, servicing the Coca-Cola machines at black places. and one, uh, as part of the while, they stopped dropping milk at the door. You know, in those days, they used to drop the beer and drop the milk on your front porch in the morning. And they put the squeeze on, and then we, uh, uh, at the time that Mr. Delane's church was burned, uh, E.M. Booker, I think his name is E.M., well, they Booker with uh, Jet, and one or two other men came into the state. They stopped at our motel and uh, disguised themselves as uh, farmers, country people, and went down into Clarendon County. Mm -hmm. And by the time they found they were there, and, and they just about did get out by the time the whites find, found they were there, and they got back to Columbia and told us that night about it. Well, then, when, uh, when uh, they dropped, they asked me that night, <coughs> the return from Lake City, they asked me, if I knew of anything that they could do, this is this is Booker now of the uh, of Jet. He asked me if they, that I knew of anything that they could do to help the people who were being pressured in these areas. I said, well, if you could just put a little box in Jet and say something about it, and uh, maybe we'll get some uh, relief, uh, help, aid from for these people from other areas, which he did. And then uh, clothing and food and medicines and candies and for Christmas and all like that came in, just flowed into the South, mm -hmm. and we dispensed it mm -hmm. through, N through NAACP. Is the South Carolina NAACP a necessary and viable organization today, or has it outlived its usefulness? I don't say that the NAACP has, um, the NAACP is a conference in South Carolina is not serving the people. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying something here that I haven't said openly on radio and, and uh, in, in public in various places. It's because uh, the administration, since the late 50s, has gotten too close to the power structure. They've just actually sold out to the South Carolina Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. So that the black vote, the black vote, it is felt that the black vote just belongs to the, to the Democratic Party. I have nothing against the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, but I'm saying that no organization should feel that it has the black vote in its pocket. But uh, when you find uh, when you find that they just about know well, the evidences that you and I know about would make you know that well, when the elections are coming up. Well, I'll say this: when you go to an NACP state conference meeting and you see all the big dogs of the uh, power structure there at the dinners and at the uh, meetings, then you know there's a dead cat on the line. Mm -hmm. Because they didn't come where we were when we had the type of organization we had in the early days of NACP. So the administration of NACP has gotten so close to the power structure that they cannot fight for the necessary things that black people need in South Carolina. 
Uh, Muhammad Ali will tell you that when you go into a scrimmage and hugging the man, you can't hit the man, see? <laughs> and so you got to get far enough from him to get your punch in. Mm -hmm. And so when the power structure of NACP is so close to the power structure of South Carolina that they can't fight for the people of South Carolina, as many problems we have, I said, no, it's not a viable organization. How do you alter that? Uh, I don't know, except you turn the river through there and wash all that bunch of cats out and start over new. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to, under the present administration, it's not going to, and I'm not, um, I'm not reflecting on the president. Mm -hmm. I think he would like to do a good job, Dr. Gibson. Mm -hmm. I am reflecting on the conference office proper. Mm -hmm. I think in a way the NACP from top down has gotten soft. Mm -hmm because the NACP has always tried to put up the front that they are the one and only. Mm -hmm. But so many other people have contributed to, mm -hmm. to, the, to the movement. And the fault that Wilkins and those always had against me was that my philosophy has always been, I will travel with anybody that's going my way. Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. And that's the reason they soured on me when I wrote, assigned the uh, petition for the Communist Eleven, because I said that if, if any time you trample on the rights of one person in America, you eventually may trample on the rights of all. Mm -hmm. So yes, I signed a petition for, for various movements. Mm -hmm. And so that's the reason they wanted to call me a fellow traveler. But I, have, I haven't had to make a strain to do it, but I vowed long ago that nobody would own the mind of a Jessica Simpson but mm -hmm. with Jessica Simpson. Mm -hmm. That's the position I've always taken. Mm -hmm. Your niece, Henri Monteith, was the first known black person to enroll at the University of South Carolina since Reconstruction, University of South Carolina. What were the circumstances that led to that enrollment? Mm -hmm. My sister vowed, she died of cancer in 69, I think it was. She vowed that it was the last thing she did, she was going to open the University of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And so she decided, she talked to the NACP, Perry being the attorney counsel at that, with the counsel at that time. And she decided whatever it took, she was going to have her child be the uh, client. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, she was teaching in the city schools. A number of the Negro teachers said, you don't know what you're going to do. You're going to lose your job and all like that. Well, she um, went on and started the case. And by the way, until she died, she had her job in, in the city schools. Mm -hmm. the, um, she started the case. It wasn't uh, finished in time for her to, um, for, for this child to get into the university at the beginning of the previous year when mm -hmm. she came in. And her children were read in Catholic schools, and she sent her to the Catholic college up in Maryland and the case was going on during that time. Judge Martin was uh, the judge in that jurisdiction. And so um, on one occasion, a, a friend of mine was driving Judge Martin, and Judge Martin sent me a message. He said, now, and these were the words. He said, you tell her that there's no reason why the decision in that case should not go, uh, should not be uh, favorable. Mm -hmm. And you tell them if it is favorable, I want them to bring that gal back here to the university. Now, those were his words. That's just the way the judge told my friend to tell me. I, so I said, well, you tell the judge, don't worry, she'll be back. And when the case was uh, decided, we brought her back down here. They decided that it might be safer for her to stay on the campus that year. And uh, I think that's when they built that building, that fence, real fence down there on Pickin Street. And they had plenty of security and protection and all like that, but there wasn't one iota of trouble. But uh, my sister knew that she had cancer then and that eventually it was going to be the victor, but she, those were her words to me. She says, the last thing I do, I'm going to pop that university wide open. She made up her mind to that, and that was the last big act she did. She did a lot of other things in the field of education, but that was what she was determined to do. Mm -hmm. That was her dying wish. Mrs. Simpkins, this December, you'll be 80 years old. Yeah. And you've lived a, a long life of viable service and have met a number of 
very interesting people. Who are some of those persons you've met who you feel have made an impact on society? I have met all the civil rights uh, stalwarts and people interested in civil rights and labor. John L. Lewis, the Ruther brothers, Harold Ickes, Clark Pullman, who founded the, one of the founders, and by the way, I was one of the founders of Southern Regional Council, and Clark Pullman was one of the founders of this Emergency Civil Liberties Committee. Uh, President Johnson, uh, on the other side, Corn Strom Thurmond. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I could just go down the line, but Mary McLeod Bethune, we were on the uh, committee, to, I mean, on the, I want, we were directors in the Southern Conference as well as in the Southern Negro Youth Congress. And I could just go on name. I have met all the stalwarts of the last two generations. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, they all don't come to me now, mm -hmm. but, but uh, Hubert Humphrey, from way back, you know, mm -hmm. from the 1948 convention. And I could, I could just name a long list, mm -hmm. but I've, I've touched them all, mm -hmm. and they've touched me one way or the other. Mrs. Simpkins, we have just tapped some of the vivid recollections that you have. You mentioned the great people you've met. You're, you're one of the great people I've met, and it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you. Madison Square Garden for the rally. Mm -hmm. It evidently aroused some concern because they wanted to know who was going to back it and who was going to pay for it. And the Brotherhood underwrote it. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, they did not have to spend a penny because the contributions that night, I think the f entrance fee was either 25 or 50 cents or whatever mm -hmm. that was, small sum, mm -hmm. uh, paid for the renting of the garden. But the Brotherhood had the courage to underwrite it. Mm -hmm. And at that meeting, uh, which was a scene I think I'll never forget, mm -hmm. the garden was packed from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. And other trade unionists had reserved boxes and participated mm 